Happy 4th of July, Americans! To my non-American friends, it's never a bad day to love the taste of liberty. This vid ain't not no gonna be no historical hocus. It's not focused on strictly US presidential history, it's more focused on our expansion history, otherwise known as Manifest Destiny. I got this idea from listening to Paul Revere and the Raider song Cherokee Nation, which if you've never listened to it, go do it now. I'm not asking you to, I, I'm telling you to. This this is an order that you're going to do. Anyway, strap yourselves in. Also, I'm sorry this video took a while. My control and tab keys stopped working, and also college was in the way for a bit, but you know, a true American perseveres. Alright, let's start. God bless America, y'all. So we're starting here in 1789 with the US looking like this. The Constitution had just been ratified, and the Americans were feeling uppity and wanting to expand. In 1792, Kentucky, otherwise known as Kentucky, gained independence from Virginia, with Tennessee following up shortly afterwards in 1796 from North Carolina. Within Tennessee, and some of North Carolina, lie the Great Smoky Mountains, a mountain range which really lives up to its name. Within this range were the Cherokee Indians, who were initially peaceful and willing to accommodate the encroaching Americans for now. Unfortunately, this would come back to bite them later. It should be noted that most Cherokee no longer live in this territory and live in Oklahoma. Most everything was about the same until 1803, when President Thomas Jefferson decided to execute the Louisiana Purchase. The US has now just bought an absolutely monstrous amount of land off of Napoleonic France. In short, this region was the entire Mississippi River watershed, and would soon become the very lifeblood of America. The southern border was protested by Spain, who said that the river was along the Calcasieu River, whereas the US asserted it to be along Texas's Sabine River. And now the proof is in the pudding. The US, a relatively large country before, had now instantly expanded all the way to the mighty and impregnable Rocky Mountains. This new territory, known as the Louisiana Territory, must be explored, thought Jefferson. So, in 1804, Jefferson organized a goon squad of 52 fellas, spearheaded by Meriwether Lewis and Will I Am Clark. Joined by other unwashed white masses, this group of Americans, known as the Corps of Discovery, spelled like corpse but not said like corpse, embarked on their journey on May 14th, 1804. Clark and his friends set out from Illinois and met up with Lewis in Missouri. From there, they sailed up the Missouri River, which wasn't too far from civilization yet. At the time, the farther west you went to North America, the more mysterious things got. Nobody knew just what the heck was out there since it was kind of a death trap just wandering off. Some people believed that there were still woolly mammoths beyond the Rocky Mountains, along with mastodons, unicorns, and moon creatures, and really anything a seven-year-old could come up with. But you know what all that equals? Money. Also along with the group was a black slave named York, just FYI. Cool fact, right? These pioneers carried fur coats, sporting fur caps or tricorn hats, with long rifles and hella powder come with. This was the explorer look of the time. After getting on and off the river many times, the group found it was best to mosey through the Plains region, specifically going through Upper Missouri and into Nebraska. They made sure to stay close to the river, hopping and bopping throughout today's Omaha and Iowa. They eventually got more intrepid and began to explore the Great Plains, veering away from the river. This great prairie was a far cry from back home in the east. They found vast, flat expanses, gently rolling hills, wildflowers and wheat fields, tall grasses, and a warm, dry sun. Grazing animals were a key feature of the area, like bison, elk, beavers, prairie dogs, weasels, and more, as well as aquatic thingies like salmon, rainbow trout, and whatever a killifish is. More animals are soon to come, don't worry. There's always more. Boy, a toque wearer's dream! That means someone who hunted furs. By the time the harsh winters rolled in, the Corps of Discovery wanted to establish relations with the Amerindian tribes in the area, not only as a sign of goodwill for the soon-to-encroach US, but also to escape the frigid blizzards. 
One of the most prominent were the Sioux Indians, also broken up into the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota, who provided the Corps with food and lodging until the gale force winds could pass. Soon, though, these relations between the two would turn hostile, mostly from a combination of coming through their territory brazenly without permission, blocking retaliatory raids, and the occasional theft. However, before tensions could explode, the Corps skedaddled. Over the next few months in 1805, the party reached North Dakota, where they surprisingly met a white guy named Toussaint Charbonneau, a fur trapper who decided to just kinda stay where he hunted and settle down in an Indian tribe's village. His underage wife was Sacagawea, or as the pros say, Sacagawea. They had just encountered the Shoshone tribe, who was friendly to the Corps of Discovery, but they did have their suspicions, having just survived a raid before. They talked and smoked and traded and exchanged pleasantries. Notes were taken and specimens were sent back to Washington, D.C. to Prez Jeff. Back in America, the expedition was of great interest to the people since the Corps of Discovery was basically the closest thing to, like, astronauts exploring space. It was decided that Sacagawea would join the Corps of Discovery for the rest of the mission to guide them through the rough terrain, navigate stuff, and also to translate. Lewis and Clark were kinda psyched, having got a plus one, but she was probably very confused considering she was a white guy's underage wife journeying into Yellowstone with a bunch of dudes, but you know, there's problems all over. Venturing westward, they found the headwaters of the Missouri River in modern-day Montana and Wyoming. At this point, they transitioned from the plains environment to one of mountains and crags and crystal clear waters. They sailed up through the Snake River in canoes, but not before getting constipated. As it turns out, eating nothing else but dried beef, hardtack, and Slim Jims on a journey of 2,000 miles across the American continent only stopping to escape natives can bound a man up for some odd reason. Luckily, they had a plan. Thunderclappers. These were pills known as, and I quote, Dr. Rush's bilious pills contain calomel, a mineral that causes turbo diarrhea in whoever pops one. It also leaked mercury into the body, which, if you don't know, can annihilate your body in tiny doses. Like, it's toxic to the touch. The core would dig holes in the ground, take a pill, and have the most thunderous dump of their lives, and when they were done, they would move on like nothing ever happened. To this day, we can put together a map of where they stopped by the mercury particles found in the ground, aka their poopies. Along the way through the Rockies, they encountered waterfalls and other wondrous sights like bears, beavers, and bald eagles. Now, bears, specifically the grizzly kind, posed a real threat to the pioneers since they were basically impossible to take down without a team of gun guys. This didn't stop Jordan Belfort from getting mauled by a grizzly bear and defeating it with the might of Odin, though. They worked their way through the Rockies and Yellowstone, navigating the perilous cliffs and drops with Sacagawea mm -hmm, as their guide. The land around this whole area was very mountainous and full of pine trees and mountain animals like rams. Paying attention to your footing was crucial because if you slipped, you were falling down a sheer cliff face turning into a juice balloon upon impact with floor zero. The Corps eventually breached the Cascade Mountains and penetrated into Oregon, and they knew they were in the right area because they saw all sorts of, like, stratovolcanoes, I think it's called, and other cool mountains. In some spots, they could even smell the Pacific Ocean, which they reached two weeks later, on November 15th, 1805, just in time for winter. For a while, they set up shop around the Pacific on the banks of the Columbia River, though it really started sucking. Many members of the party had died from disease, bear attack episodes, hunger, and everything else. Around these parts, they ran into the Chinook tribe, who gave them direction and told them to kick rocks when they were done snooping around. The weather became really stormy and rainy, as it often is in the Pacific Northwest, and then combine that with the thick snow of the winter and you have the perfect recipe for let's stay in the fort until winter ends. On March 23rd, they decided to return home and undo all that progress. We aren't getting into that because it's their return voyage, sorry but you got it from here. This era now marked the rise of mountain men, or pioneers who trekked the Rockies and would fill up the rest of the century. In 1810, America acquired the Republic of West Florida and incorporated it into the Orleans Territory, which is fake Louisiana. This strip of land around the Perdido River split off from the Florida Panhandle, 
which is still a detached part of Spain. America, not dealing with this tomfoolery, invaded and took it, which somehow didn't cause a war. Louisiana also becomes a state. Cool, huh? Party on. 1816, Indiana gains statehood. Come on, look at this scenery. Indiana will go on to become one of America's most powerful states. LOL, JK. A year later, Mississippia will become a state complete with bayous and racism and magnolias. Also, James Monroe is the president now, the last of the Declaration Daddies. In 1818, we finally got Illinois as a state. Illinois is replete with a lakefront view, fertile soil, corn, corn, and wheat, and this PDF I found from the Illinois state government with facts about the state. In 1819, America set its sights on the Pacific yet again, carving up the Oregon Territory, now certifying both America's and the UK's presence in the Pacific. The Oregon Territory was under joint control of both, certifying that America had now gone from sea to shining sea. In 1821, the US did a little trolling with Spain under the adams onis Treaty, otherwise known as the Florida Purchase. For the low, low price of 5,000 bands, the US would acquire Florida in exchange for settling the border dispute in Tejas. That and to make sure Britain didn't get to Florida first. Missouri also becomes a state, discarding its huge shell and turning this medium little fella here. Very little happened until 1831 with the Trail of Tears under President Andrew Jackson. Action Jackson ordered five tribes, the Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Muskegee, and Seminole, to abandon their native lands and head out west to Oklahoma, where they were relocated to permanently, as to let in white settlers into their previous lands. North of 100,000 natives did so under threat of violence, often with guns pointed at them on the journey. Most had little resources to make the journey, with many dying of disease, starvation, or exhaustion. The Seminole, native to Florida, resisted against this, and waged brutal jungle guerrilla warfare on the Americans for 41 years in the depths of Florida. 1836, Arkansas gains statehood. 1837, Michigan also becomes a state. In March of 1845, Florida becomes a state, but that's like the least event of this year. So at the time, Mexico had this rebellious part of the country in modern-day Texas that had a lot of intermingling between the native Catholic Mexicans and the Protestant white immigrants, mostly British and American. This amount of friction and cultural diffusion caused Texas to realize that they were a different breed, so they declared independence in 1836 and wanted to join the U.S. After deliberating, America scooped up Texas and annexed it as a state. However, this huge disputed territory between Mexico and the U.S. caused tons of ill will, since Mexico refused to recognize American authority over the Texiites. Real quick, Iowa becomes a state. Aww. Anyways, the next year, the war broke out between the two powers and is also when the idea of Manifest Destiny began, which is basically the US believing that it's their divine destiny to expand across the continent. They were placed in the east, so they must go to the west. 1847 was also the year America gave independence to its only colony in Africa, Liberia, now a strong US ally in the jungles of West Africa. The U.S. won this war, which was both a blessing and a curse. On one hand, it made the U.S. significantly more powerful, but it also greatly expanded slavery. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848 gave America this huge swath of land. The Oregon Territory also got adjusted along the border with British Canada as well. Wisconsin Statehood 1849 marked the California Gold Rush, when American settlers in this new post-Mexico region discovered gold in Sutter's Mill, California. Knowing how exponentially important this was, word spread like wildfire across America. With the start of the gold rush, hundreds of thousands of pioneers came forth all across the world, mainly America, but also Earth, to pan for gold with their sieves. Oh, I hate that word. All throughout the land west of the Rockies. The land was not the usual rocky and green, pine-tree-laden, weed-smoking environment. The land was a flat, scorching-hot, sandy, rocky, hilly desert. Mountains and valleys and badlands sprawled across a vast expanse of terrain, with whole new plants like cacti. Most of these people did not strike it rich, finding a grand total of squat out west. 
The few that did found quick success in gaining wealth, jumping from rags to riches for their family. Settlers from all over made the perilous voyage to go out west, really jump-starting the whole pioneer wagon culture. Countless American families scrambled to go west in Conestoga wagons, following the Oregon Trail, a 2,000-mile-long, well-traveled trail that went from Independence, Missouri to the Willamette Valley of Oregon. If you were persevering enough, this mighty trail could bring your family a new start in a fresh, untapped region. It's estimated that over 400,000 families took the journey across the trail, but only around 80,000 made it alive, considering you had to survive, like, Indian attacks, that's one, crossing the Rocky Mountains, that's two, not dying of starvation, or dysentery, or getting banditoed, uh, pretty much every threat ever. Although the Oregon Trail led to Americans feeling connected to their west coast finally, it also contributed to Little House on the Prairie. What's even cooler than Laura Ingalls Wilder is that the so-called American frontier and all its tribulations, such as the Native American raids. Now that Americans were expanding across the Great Plains, raids and attacks from various Indian nations became common and absolutely deathly feared. Among these were a few particularly feared tribes, such as the Apache in New Mexico, the Kiowa in southern Montana, the Cherokee, now relocated to Oklahoma and back with a vengeance, and much more. However, the most most feared was the Comanche. The Comanche were an absolutely brutal, and to me kind of awesome, warrior tribe who were so feared that they prevented much of the Spanish from moving into Texas for a long time. The Comanche were a group of Plains Indians native to Comancheria here on a map, who didn't take anything off of anyone. With their horses, they moved at lightning fast speeds, raped, pillaged, and scalped. Now, I don't blame them entirely, I think they're really cool, I'm a huge fan of Native American warrior tribes, but whatever. People of the steppe, dude, heck yeah. In fact, they were such a problem to American frontiersmen that it took the combined efforts of both the Union and Confederacy to take down Comanche and Apache forces, especially with the feared chief Quanna Parker. And they didn't even surrender until 1875, that's the crazy part. This new and absolutely gigantic and sudden increase of people to California led to it becoming a state in 1850. To solidify our power over modern-day Washington state, we defeated the Yakima people, just for a nice bit of genocide. 1858, Minnesota, and 1859, Oregon. 1861, during the Civil War hilariously, Kansas becomes a state now that many of the natives were killed or displaced to let the white man in. And just in case the Confederacy didn't get the message, Nevada became a state in 1864 somehow. How that state exists is beyond me. In 1867, the US purchased Alaska off the Russian Empire. Yes, like with a physical check. This one specifically. Many Americans weren't super into this since we just finished a civil war and were pretty darn poor, and we were snapping up a bunch of seemingly cold, useless land in the most isolated corner of the continent. Alaska was very remote, frigid, covered in volcanoes, mountains, and pine trees, and had little people anywhere. Weirdest enough, it also had a bunch of abandoned Russian settlements from their previous colonization. Places like Baranoff Island and Novo Arkhangelsk would percolate into American name culture and turn into nice American-sounding names like Baranoff Island and Sitka. States stayed put until 1876 with the addition of Colorado, or Colorado, really springboarding America into the cowboy era, the Wild West. How fun. I mean, cowboys had already, like, existed out west for quite some time now, but the culture was really seeping in like a nice tea bag. 1889 was an eventful year. Both of the Dakotas became states, as well as Montana and Washington. It was pretty clear to everyone at this point that America was basically a global power. Following this in 1890 was Idaho and Wyoming, and by the way, Idaho doesn't get a lot of love despite being beautiful and having great weather, people, and geography. I mean, sure, they have the occasional hate group, but who doesn't? 
In 1896, Utah became a state, having previously had an irredentist movement known as Deseret, which was a giant Mormon state, and uh, totally not a theocracy, with slavery and beehives. However, this never came to fruition, so they settled with Salt Flat Sally here. 1898, America won the Spanish-American War and gained a whole bunch of goodies, including but not limited to Guam, American Samoa, literally all of the Philippines, Hawaii after overthrowing their queen with bananas, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. America was now connected to tiny Pacific islands and uh, tasty, yummy guano, but more importantly, a whole new ocean culture and more indigenous people with their newly acquired Pacific islands. They wasted no time in setting up banana plantations, but this also added the culture of the Pacific Ocean peoples into American public consciousness. Things like Polynesian culture, bananas, coconuts, pufferfish, palm trees, and everything else now became a new curiosity for the American public in pop culture, like the Fiji Mermaid. 1903, the US gained control over the Panama Canal Zone for the next 76 years, birthing John McCain. In 1906, the US gained control yet again over Guatemala and Honduras in what were known as the Banana Republics which were bogus countries the U.S. controlled the market of by flooding it with hyper-capitalist banana plantations. This ended a few years later after we kept owning and disowning them, but, you know, somehow Nicaragua got thrown in, you get it. 1907, Oklahoma becomes a state with a significant Native American presence, pretty cool. In 1912, both Arizona and New Mexico become super-hot desert states, taking up the Sonoran Desert, which has its own cool culture now, with Joshua Trees, Gila Monsters, Monument Valley, Bead Doors, Aliens, RVs, and the Night Sky. Both of these states were also more in tune with the plight of the natives, but they still treated them pretty badly. They also like wolves. In 1915, we controlled Haiti to restore order after their leader got murked, and took over the Dominican Republic the following year to protect it from the Germans in World War I. Basically, we owned Hispaniola. The next year, in 1917, we bought the US Virgin Islands <laughs> off of Denmark. The lower 48 has now been solidified with states. We relinquished Hispaniola in 1934 and acquired Greenland in 1940 to protect it from the Germans. In 1941, we controlled Iceland for the same reason, and the Japanese nabbed Guam, the Philippines, and the Northern Mariana Islands, and all the rest from our Pacific realm. After the end of the war, we gave up everything, except not really. Well, that brings us to the end of our journey. Remember, we aren't doing a history of America here, we're doing a history of American expansionism. I think this video came out amazing, how about you? And for any other funky little fellows who want to claim I skipped over stuff, just remember that most people are probably pretty used to videos that are called like, uh, I don't know, History of the United States of America, condensed to 20 minutes, question mark, exclamation mark? This isn't that. So, I hope you y'all have a very happy and very safe 4th of July. I have the statistics to prove otherwise, so don't make me bust out the paperwork. And remember that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. God bless America, God bless freedom, and remember, Epstein didn't kill himself.